Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining this afternoon's Try This at Work Teams in 30 events on security and compliance. We are very blessed today to have Mr. Brent Mitchell with us, who, as you all very well know, if you attended any of the Try This at Work events last year, is a uh, Microsoft 365 guru and a Microsoft Teams guru. So we are um, very happy to have him here today. He's going to be walking us through security compliance with Microsoft Teams. Um, again, my name is Kelly Cleland. I'm a customer success manager and a Try This at Work leader. But with that, we're going to go ahead and get started as we have a lot of content to get through. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it off. Brent, it's all you. And Brent, whenever you're ready to get started with your audio. Thank you, Kelly. All right, so welcome everyone. We are, uh, I am super excited to be here today. Um, one of the things that uh, I was excited about is I was involved early on in kind of the creation of this Try This at Work. And so it's really cool to come back and see Try This at Work under the leadership of Kelly and some others within our uh, customer success team, which is where it belongs. But I have been really um, busy talking to a lot of our largest and most strategic customers around this whole idea of modern security and compliance. And so the reason I have evolved having this conversation with customers is because we combine two things in this 30 minutes that you're going to spend with us today. One of them is uh, has to do with this whole idea of how do we uh, secure and make you compliant with all of the the uh, the things that you have to abide by within your organization. And we do that through the lens of the fastest growing application in the history of our company here at Microsoft and that's through Teams. And so the reason I love having this conversation with customers is because I feel like I'm uh, at, uh, I'm basically representing Satya, right? This is what keeps our CEO up at night. Uh, he realizes that folks like each of you watching this, whether you're looking at it through the lens of a uh, of a consumer or from an organization, you're not going to use things that you don't trust these days. And so, again, one of the things that we pride ourselves on here at Microsoft is everything we do is done through the lens of, uh, of security and compliance. And here's why that's the case. Uh, we know all of us, if I could see you all, you'd probably all be nodding your heads up and down, right? We know that things like bad actors, uh, they're increasing in numbers, but also they're increasing in their creativity, right? And the, the uh, level of sophistication they're bringing to try and attract, attack you and your organization. Also, if you look at it through that lens, the digital state, that's a fancy word for the number of the amount of data that your organization creates. Um, is exponentially higher than it has been in the past. And what does that do? That gives all of those creative and sophisticated bad actors a bigger surface to try and attack you and your organization. And then the third item there is really representative of a change of mindset that we used to see with security uh, minded people where they would put smart people in front of these really big monitors and they would try and look for anomalies within uh, their organization so that they go, could go and take action. And we all know that that, uh, that approach really is not the most modern approach. In fact, if you look at some of the, the biggest breaches that have hit the, uh, the front page of the newspaper, um, you would probably remember that most bad actors and some of those breaches are in the organization uh, for almost a year before they're ever discovered. And so they've already come in, they've wreaked havoc uh, within, your, uh, within your organization and then they're gone and then you discover what took place. And then you have to unfortunately reach out to all your customers and say, hey, we feel like your data may have been breached. And then you go spend a lot of money uh, to try and recover those customers by giving them things like you know, identity protection and things of that nature. And just to kind of put icing on the cake, uh, what I love to show my security and compliance minded brethren within the accounts that we walk in the doors of, is an example of how the bad actors are going after um, your your uh, organization. And so I love showing this slide, right? Because 
This is back in 2016. And if you look at this, it's a study done by Market Watch, and they said, look, 20% of your employees would sell their corporate email and password um, for a thousand bucks or less, I believe. And so it just shows you, uh, and it's a great question for every company I get in front of, like, how would you know if me, Brent, sold my uh, corporate ID and password to a bad actor or sold it on the the uh, the, the black market um, for a certain amount of money, how would you pick up on that? And so that's really where Microsoft has changed the game. And we're in a position like no other vendor from the security and compliance space to give you a unique perspective perspective and a super unique value uh, when it comes to enabling that type of protection. And so all of it behind the scenes, all of the investments that we make from a security and compliance perspective, really take advantage of what we call the Microsoft Intelligence Security Graph. And so I'll draw your attention to some of the items, right? So if you see down here at the bottom right, just look at the uh, the authentications that we see monthly, 450 billion authentications every month come through our platform. And so every time somebody comes to our platform as an authentication, we gather a ton of different signals about that authentication and we keep those signals so we learn about you and your users and the the things that represent that authentication like hey were they working at home were they in what geography um, what isp are they using all of those things and then i always draw attention over here to this uh this data point which is we see around 400 billion emails um, each month right and so if you think of all those emails uh, each one of those is a signal, but it's a unique opportunity for us to really help protect you and your company. So if you think of that, think of a, a person that's patient zero sitting in the middle of Timbuktu somewhere and somebody attacks them with a with some malicious attachment, let's say. So if it's Windows, uh, let's say it's Microsoft Defender ATP that sees this malicious code running on a machine, it's going to immediately feed this security graph and say, hey, every other part of Microsoft, you need to be aware Here's a bad signature of a file or a partial signature of a file that you should not let in anywhere. So if it comes through email, we're going to block it, right? If it comes through another machine, let's say somebody sends it to a Gmail account and you try and download that file and open it on a Windows machine, it's going to be aware of the fact that that's a bad piece of code and it will prevent that from running. And so we, I like to refer to this as the largest a neighborhood watch program on the planet, right? So as soon as your neighbor sees somebody walking through the neighborhood and they may uh, be behaving a little sketchy, typically they try and communicate with everyone else in the neighborhood. That's a, essentially what we're doing here, powered by this intelligent security graph to make every tenant safe once we see that first occurrence of some attack on another tenant. And then the other astonishing data figure, just to kind of uh, challenge the mindset of, hey, others are doing similar things, we see we have the largest enterprise um, uh, productivity suite on the planet and so nobody comes close to gathering this many signals across our platform 6.5 trillion signals that we have the ability to analyze daily and when we say analyze daily we're we're applying machine learning and artificial intelligence again to make sure that we're leveraging all these signals to keep you and every other customer of microsoft safe so Let's talk about our, our unique approach lately to talking to customers around security and compliance. So at Microsoft, we believe everybody should be covered from the boardroom all the way through your first line workers. And we have a, 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 a bunch of great news to share, uh, kind of driven by this slide. So when we get in front of our security and compliance folks, we always say, look, we're going to make some assumptions here. Um, all of these bubbles fully represent all the things that keep a security and compliance minded person up at night. And we always go around the room and say, would everyone in the room agree? And of course, it, early on in our uh, doing this, we would add some, th some things, right? But we're at a point now where we're pretty confident this is all inclusive. And the last one, if you're interested, was this investigation and legal that we added. Um, so once we go and establish, hey, is there anything you would add that's not represented here? Um, then we move to the next question, which is, hey, which one of these could your company do without? And then we allow this awkward pause, right? Because it's important for people that are so used to, to going through the daily minutia of um, security and compliance to kind of rethink things a little bit. And so I will literally let customers sit there and then somebody says, hey, Brent, we know that's a trick question. Of course, we need all of this. 
And then I say, aha, you're right. I agree with you, right? Because this is why Microsoft invests a gazillion dollars a year um, into making sure that we give you the best coverage in all of these scenarios. And we understand that a lot of our customers have third party point solutions that are filling the gaps in some of these areas. What I always tell my customers is today is the day where you want to bring us to the table and make us prove to you that we are better than the competition in each of these realms, right? And so notice also how nice it is that I don't have a bunch of product names listed here. It's just the scenarios so that you can understand the, the different things that we're claiming we can solve for you um, using our Microsoft 365 platform. Now, this is when you'll see product names. And the reason we do this, um, and, and by the way, sometimes I'll say, but if you're using third-party products to fill any of these gaps, let us know which ones they are and we'll go through and we can you know, hone in. And again, we'd love to come show you how we uh, can exceed your expectations and exceed what those products are doing uh, with our Microsoft 365 uh, investments. So then I build it out and I'm like, okay, let's make it real. So for example, if a customer said, Brent, we'd like to prioritize you coming and talking to, 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 uh, to us about zero day attacks. We would come on site and we'd walk through each of these product or experiences with you that directly relate to zero day attacks so that you walk away from that conversation saying, wow, um, Microsoft's really been up to a lot of interesting things and they truly are better than the other vendors that we've used historically. Next, you might say, hey, Brent, we'd love for you to talk to us about data leakage. Maybe we had an incident. We really want to hone in and, and, um, and build some muscle in this area. Great. We're going to come and talk to you about all of these things. So it's a super refreshing uh, approach because we don't have to boil the ocean uh, in one setting and walk you through everything uh, that we have as part of our, uh, our investments around security and compliance. And the other thing that people love is we used to approach customers with a laundry list of products and say, here's what you get in Microsoft 365 E3, and here's what you get in Microsoft 365 E5. And then a lot of times they'd look at that and say, well, what in the heck is this Azure AD P2 risk-based, right? So now they at least know that that is associated with things like impossible travel. So this is where it gets really magical because again, most of our customers are like, look, we don't really want Microsoft coming in and selling us on all of the security stuff that you've done, but we would certainly like to understand what we're walking away from if we decided to go with a Microsoft 365 E3 investment versus E5. So that's where this starts happening, which, which makes your decision very easy, right? And at least you walk away knowing exactly what you get or what you're walking away from with your decision. So everything in red, is part of what we consider our advanced capabilities. That's a short way of saying it's part of Microsoft 365 E5. Everything that is in black is included in your Microsoft 365 E3 uh, capabilities. And so what's exciting about this is people walk away just looking at this, this uh, one slide by saying, look, the only thing we can solve from Microsoft, right, holistically with our Microsoft 365 E3 investments is this mobility bubble. Everything else requires a piece of that Microsoft 365 E5 uh, uh, SKU or package that Microsoft has available for us. And so now we leave it in your hands. Hey, we've done our job. We've explained to you the scenarios. We've explained to you now the products and if they're part of that um, E3 or E5 investment. And now this is my favorite part. And this is probably what you've all been waiting on is I then say, look, if you're going to invest in E5, right, Microsoft 365 E5, you should understand how we're going to protect you specifically through the lens of this fastest growing application in the history of our company called Teams. And so that's what we're going to now double click on. And so I always set the, the stage here. This is a great slide if you're ever trying to explain internal to your organization, like what's the power of Microsoft 365. Um, you can really uh, bucket all of the investments in th these four different pillars, right? So it all boils down to identity management, devices and app management, threat protection, and then data governance and information protection. Um, I am going to, because most people say, look, show me all of the goodness associated with Microsoft 365 E5. Um, so I'm going to leave out that devices and app management because you get that as part of E3. Um, and so I'm going to show off a lot of the new advanced capabilities that um, are part of identity management, threat protection, and data governance and information protection. So let's take a look at those. But first and foremost, 
I'm going to open up. This is the Edge browser. I know it says Tor there. I've just gone to the Tor website. You'll see why I've done that in a moment. But I'm going to the Edge browser. I've opened it up and I want to tell a quick story. So let's pretend that I'm building a home and while I'm building the home, I'm staying at my in-laws house. And so I'm on my mother-in-law's machine and I, you know, every day I wake up and she doesn't want me to install things on her machine. So I just go to the browser and every morning I go to teams.microsoft.com. And so uh, I've been doing this now for, let's say, a few weeks. And so initially when I signed in, I probably was prompted with MFA, multi-factor authentication, because it was like, hey, Brent, you're coming from a, a weird location we haven't seen yet. We'll get into that in a second. But now we find ourselves where we are. So this morning I get up and I go to check uh, you know, I go to, to point my favorite browser to teams.microsoft.com. And this is where we're going to show off the risk-based conditional access. Again, every time I go and access our tenant, we get signals about that authentication. So we're going to be able to see things like, hey, what browser are they coming from? Is this a known, case, a known location? Uh, do we, has Brent come to us through this ISP before? Uh, and things like that. So watch what happens. I'm going to come in. And I'm going to go to teams.microsoft.com. It's going to prompt me to sign in. And I'm going to say, okay, I'm, my name is Brent and I'm, uh, my email is brent at trilabcentral.com. It's going to prompt me for a passcode. And so I'll go in and enter my uh, passcode here and then I'll sign in. And so a lot of people are looking for something really interesting to happen here. And, and the point is nothing really interesting happened. Uh, it just let me right into my tenant and I launched Teams in the browser and I have an amazing experience. And so what I want, the, 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 the value that I just showed you here is we pride ourselves in giving your users the most frictionless experience, but we also make sure that we put a ton of security compliance behind to make sure that that authentication was in fact a secure authentication uh, and safe um, before we let them in. And so to prove that, Right. So, so in other words, I go sign in. It's looked at all the signals that supplied machine learning and AI to all of my past authentications. And then it looks at what's happening during this authentication and it said, hey, it's Brent. We know it is because it matches everything he's done in the past. Now, inversely, if I go open up the Tor browser, the Tor browser is uh, interesting because it's what most bad actors use to hide from the good folks in the world, right? So the Tor browser, if you're not familiar with it, it bounces you all over the world um, and it really does a great job of hiding who you are and where you're located. And so in this browser, I'm gonna now go to the same website and this time it's gonna prompt me. So nothing really new. You're gonna notice there's a little lag and the lag is the result of this thing bouncing all over the world and having multiple hops before it gets to the, uh, to the end point. And so now I'm going to go in and I'll enter my same password. And so once again, in real time, we're going to look at all the signals associated with this authentication. And we're going to say, wait a minute, we suspect uh, some activity that is suspicious, right? So we picked up on some things and looking at all the signals that came through with this authentication, it could have been, hey, Brent logged in from Charlotte, North Carolina an hour ago, and now he's trying to log in with the correct user ID and password, by the way, but from Berlin, that's an impossible travel scenario. So we're not gonna uh, just automatically let him in, right? We're gonna make sure that Brent says he is who he's uh, telling us he is. Um, it could have been that this is a brand new ISP. We've never seen Brent authenticate in this IS from this ISP before. So there's a multitude of these signals that you get to go in to your tenant and as an IT professional, configure and give risk scores to each one of these. And then what you do is say, hey, if we exceed the threshold of this risk score, we want to make sure that maybe we don't cut the legs out of this uh, off from this authentication, but we may want to put a little speed bump there, right? So in this scenario, we picked up that, hey, suspicious activities detected. And now I'm going to come down and I'm going to say, sure, I'll verify I am who I say I am. And so we're using uh, the Authenticator app here. And so again, we're using multi-factor authentication. So we only prompt the user for this in the scenario where the signals uh, indicate that we should prompt them for a multi-factor auth. And so here I am on my phone, this little piece of toast pops up. If, I, if it's not me trying to log in, of course I'm gonna say deny it. I'm not logging into Office 365, but if it is me, I'll go click the approve button. And once I click approve, you'll see that I go right to the to the point where I can launch that 
web browser experience of Teams, just like I did um, on the first authentication. So that's the value of that risk-based conditional access as part of our advanced uh, package, that E5 package. Next, I want to introduce you to Office 365. So there's two things that Office 365 ATP does. Of course, we started all of these investments in email, then we trickled them out to things like OneDrive and SharePoint uh, to protect your, uh, your tenant when people are uploading files to both of those cloud locations. And now we've really propagated all of these investments into anywhere your user can access um, an Office 365 experience. So as an example, um, we do not only do we protect you with attachments that you share through uh, Teams because the back end is OneDrive and SharePoint in all cases, but also look what happens when I go in and try and attack someone internally. Of course, this works externally as well, but we see a lot of people being creative and trying to come in and internally uh, fish for people's information to sell it on the black market. Uh, and so here's me going to Emily and saying, hey, Emily, here's a link to the site. You should visit ASAP, right? And so Emily might be new. She's a little vulnerable. Um, and so she's, if I look at Emily over here, right? So she's like, oh, Brent's such a nice guy. I'm going to come over here and click on anything he sends me, right? Because he'd never do anything malicious. So when she clicks on that spam link.contoso.com, immediately we cut her off and say, nope, you're not going to go to that uh, site whatsoever. And so that's super important because you want that comprehensive coverage, not just from an email perspective, but you want it to include things like Teams where you're expecting all of your users to live uh, moving forward with their productivity, either it's communication or collaboration experiences. And not only that, um, you want to carry that into um, things outside of just email, right? So think of chatting with people and, and think of internal um, perhaps people that are malicious trying to gain access to different credentials. And so what I'm showing you here is something that no other vendor will do within Teams, right? We're the only ones that can pro provide that safe links solution within the realm of Teams. Um, in fact, if I go over here and I look at my Android phone, same thing would happen for iOS, by the way. I just happen to carry an Android. You'll see that Patrick Kelly sent me a, a message up at the top. And what you'll see is, um, is he sends me that same link, right? Spam link. So when I click on it on my mobile, same thing happens. No, nope, we're not going to let you go to this website. So that's important for you to understand that we don't just build this into the desktop experience. If you're within Teams anywhere, you're going to get this uh, safe links uh, service saving all of your users as they're chatting or they're in a channel somewhere, um, et cetera. So now let's move over to something that's super important called information barriers. So a lot of people call this ethical walls, right? So in Teams, it's a brand new experience for a lot of organizations and they already have these ethical walls set up. So the, uh, the example you know, that I always use is, let's say you have a marketing company and marketing company A uh, or marketing team A is helping, um, you know, let's just use uh, Pepsi Cola and Coca-Cola as an example, right? So Contoso, Corporation uh, represents both Pepsi Cola and Coca Cola. So they would, inside of uh, Contoso, they're probably contractually obligated not to share information or not to ever talk to each other. And so the way we would go about doing that in Teams is we'd set up an information barrier. So to walk you through that, watch Jordan as part of, let's just say, the Coca Cola internal Contoso team for marketing. And he's going to try and reach out to someone who represents uh, Pepsi Cola in the Contoso uh, marketing team. And so when he goes to start this conversation, you'll see this as, ah, we failed miserably because as an organization, we put up this information barrier. That's a policy that I set that says, hey, people from one marketing team can't talk to the other marketing team. And then most customers say, what happens if we have existing conversations? And so if I come over here and I click on, uh, you know, why did this happen? You do see that, you know, we lead you to, to this article where it says, hey, information barriers are put in place by your IT folks. But if I go look at existing conversations like this one over here by Emily, right, between her and Jordan, they're kind of, they've, before we set the policy in place, they were able to span, you know, and communicate with each other. So we leave it, that conversation there, but notice we've, we've indicated at the bottom, hey, your administrator has disabled chat for this user now. And then if the same thing happens, if you have very similar, I would say, um, with a group chat or a big channel with a lot of people in it, and that channel or that group chat violates the policy we just put in place, um, on a last in first out perspective, we'll remove people until that, that um, policy is now respected. So 
Next, let's move right along to something that is top of mind for every uh, organization. And that's all about how do we prevent certain data from getting into the wrong hands, but also encourage people to share and collaborate in new and exciting ways. And so data loss prevention is something that really encourages that um, and protects your users and the data at the same time. So to give you an idea, once again, I'm going to go to my good friend Diego up here. I'm going to start a conversation and I'm basically going to try and send him a credit card number. Let's pretend that he's at some catering company uh, and he's waiting for a, a form of payment. And so I'm going to say, hey, here's the credit card number to use for the catering company. And then I'll put the standard testing credit card number. Uh, and then I always try to have fun and say, hey, I found this in the parking lot. And then what you'll notice is it says, hey, the message was blocked, right? And so as a user, I might say, what, what in the world was I blocked for, right? I'm trying to send something internally um, and it happens to be a credit card. So if I click on this, what can I do? You'll see you can even customize the, uh, the message, the, the policy that's presented to the user. Are you crazy? You can't send credit card numbers to anyone. And then we tell you it was a credit card number that violated that policy. And so if I want to shift gears and look at what Diego sees, he may be waiting for me, right? Um, to send him something. He won't ever see the information I sent, but he does see that I tried to send him something and it was blocked due to sensitive content. And once again, if I go to my mobile device and I try and do the same thing, and this is an area I'm gonna try and send Grady a credit card number. As soon as I hit the send button, uh, you'll see that it looks like it's about to go over to Grady and then all of a sudden it comes back and says, ah, not so fast, we're gonna block that for you also. And so again, your folks don't intentionally um, always try to share things that they shouldn't. Um, and so this is just a great way of letting them feel like they're able to collaborate and communicate with whomever they want, but then prevent them from sharing things they shouldn't to some of those same people. Okay, this is another great example, cloud app security session proxy. So if you've never heard of cloud app security, it's again, all of these are part of our advanced capabilities, right? And so um, I'm gonna show you one minuscule piece of cloud app security from a value perspective that um, really resonates with people around Teams. So here I am again, maybe Diego's at his uh, in-laws and Diego happens to be one of those people that overshares things, right? And uh, perhaps things that he shouldn't even know about. And so you'll see he's in the store inventory portal or a store inventory uh, channel. And he finds this weird document that mentions this project Alta. This happens to be some secret covert project that you know the company's working on. And so he's gonna go and start blabbing his mouth in, in this public setting, hey, has anyone heard of? And he's gonna try and paste that in and watch what happens. Our cloud app security blocks that pasting because we know again that that project Alta should never be spoken about or, or used um, even within our company, right? And you can assign those DLP policies to different people. Um, and so again, a great example of things that customers aren't thinking through when they're selecting the vendors to help protect their data um, from a security and compliance perspective. This is probably one of the most exciting additions that we've been working on here at Microsoft. It's something that no other vendor, to my knowledge, is doing in the security and compliance space. And it's really around helping organizations that are creating these elaborate internal investigation and risk mitigation teams how would we enable you to understand if the behavior of someone has changed or the behavior someone's exhibiting when communicating with others is not in line with what your corporate uh, policy would, would approve of. And so we call it anti-harassment. So just to show you how this works, I'm gonna go into poor Diego here and I'm gonna say, hey Diego, you are stupid. And I would never do this in the real world, you can ask Kelly. Um, but in order to show you this, I have to do something that is like a bullying um, activity or uh, you know harassment activity. And so notice I don't get any alert. Nothing pops up and says, oh, you know, Brent, you shouldn't have sent that. Diego doesn't get anything on his end as well. Um, but if I'm the compliance officer, I now have the ability to come into the security and compliance center. I can go down to the supervision aspect of the security and compliance center. And when I click on that, you're going to see this new policy that I've created. And this policy is called an anti-harassment policy. So when I click on that anti-harassment policy, I'll open it up. And what you'll notice is I have two pending items to review. So I'm going to click on those two pending items. The first one that says Brent sent a message, you'll see it, you know, I sent it in Teams, that top one. When I click on that message and I scroll down, you'll see there's in fact that message, hey, you are stupid. 
Um, as a compliance officer, all this stuff over here on the right hand side is super, uh, I'm used to seeing all these things. So I can mark it as compliant, non-compliant, questionable, comment, save it, whatever. Now, the second item over here that says demo, this is a really cool demo in itself because what I did is I reached out to the person who owns all of the anti-harassment work that we're doing at Microsoft. And I said, hey, could you send me an email that shows me all the things that I could, you know, put into um, a chat to fire off the uh, the demo, you know, this this policy. And um, these are all the things that uh, that he sent me, right? So how do I ignore your pathetic existence? That's always a fun one to uh, discuss with customers and get some laughing. But what I'm showing you here is we don't just cover uh, Teams messages, whether it's in a chat, a group chat, um, or a, a team channel, right? We also now are covering email. And so those are the two primary modes of communication. So this anti-harassment work is already out of the gate, helping you pick up on maybe that anomaly in, in user um, uh, communication so that you can maybe hedge off an incident that, that you may not have been able to do in the past. Okay, the last worth mentioning thing to kind of drive home through the lens of teams why would we want to not have this this package called E5 is the the things that we've done around advanced e-discovery. So just to put it in perspective, e-discovery